Change is nerve-wracking, yet exhilarating. May it be in the places we've been, the people we've met, or the experiences we've had. We hold on to what is known and familiar. Yet, with these changes, we can discover the vast diversity of cultures, beliefs, and values that life demands us to experience outside our comfort zones. Hey Tigers, I am Denise, and welcome to another episode of Culture Shot. continuous process, they say. For one to discover themselves and pursue their passion, one must be willing to learn continuously. This is true for those who are eager to hone their skills and contribute to the field they chose by pursuing a master's or doctorate degree. Yet, learning is not always easy. Accomplishing a doctorate degree already bears challenges on its own. But what more if it is done during a time of pandemic in another country, away from your friends and family? More than studying for the field away from your support system, you will also be exposed to new cultures, traditions, and norms of the country you're in. How shocking may this experience be? Well, we're on our way to find out. Today's episode talks about the culture shock experience of pursuing a doctorate degree in a foreign country amidst the pandemic. To know more about this, we have three professors from the Faculty of Arts and Letters who recently got their doctorate degrees in Australia. Here with us today are Assistant Professor Pia Patricia Tenedero from Macquarie University, Ms. Darlene Demandante, also from Macquarie University in Sydney, and Assistant Professor Jeremiah Opiniano from the University of Adelaide. Good afternoon to our dearest professors and welcome to the show. Good afternoon, Ms. Darlene and Ms. Pia. How are you doing, Ms. Darlene? How are you doing right now? I'm good, thanks. Yeah. What about Ms. Pia? Are we doing good too? Of course, of course. Good to be in the show, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, good day first to uh, yes. one and all. I hope the Delta variant is not uh, dampening your spirits and your mental health and well-being. Please keep safe. So, good afternoon. All right. It's good to know that you both are doing well, especially despite the circumstances that we are in right now. Based on research, we both know that you guys pursued your PhDs in Australia, right? What made you choose this country and the university for completing your doctorate degree? Let's begin with Ms. Pia. Uh, actually, that's a very interesting question, but thinking about it, I think it's really more of the school and the country that chose me rather than I choosing the university and the country because um, I had to apply and it was the, the university that, give, that gave me the opportunity to be admitted to the program and to be supported with full scholarship that I eventually went with and so for me that was Macquarie University in Sydney. Thank you so much for that. What about Mr. Lee? What made you choose Macquarie University? Um, I, I think my story is different because in my case, I chose the university because of the supervisor. I mean, I had to find someone who was um, a, an expert in the field that I'm working on. So I work in, I work in philosophy and um, the particular philosopher that I am working on, um, he has a lot of interpreters and one of the interpreters is my supervisor. So when I found out that my supervisor was working at Macquarie Uni, um, I decided to send him an email and then he replied and then the rest is history. The University of Adelaide was the one uh, that accepted me. So that's the only one that gave me a full scholarship. So I, I never said no anymore. And it came at the right time that I'm about to end my term at the time as head of the journalism program. So it was it was uh, a fortune for me to try it out there. Adelaide is, uh, for, for everyone's information, Adelaide is a rural city. So it's a regional city. Region, re, regional is what Auss Aussies call rural. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's said to be among the top 10 cities that are most livable in the world. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Different experiences, but both of you landed to a very good university in Australia. And now I'm getting more curious about how to apply at this university. 
Moving on to our next question with Mr. Lean, can you share to us your experience or your process of applying for graduate school abroad? Okay, uh, do you want a detailed story? <laughs> it's, yes, it's good. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, so I had to find a supervisor, and then um, I had to email my supervisor and ask him if, if he was interested to work on the research that I plan to work on. And then he asked me for some writing samples, and then I sent him that. And then after that, he told me that I can apply for a scholarship. I, I can apply to the uni. So that's basically what I did. And fortunately, during that time, there was a scholarship available. So. Um, I I did it. I mean, I applied and they accepted me. Oh, wow. With Miss Pia, Miss Pia, we want to know what is the actual process of applying to the university? Yes, darling. Yes. You need to have a supervisor first. Yes, right? supervisor. So, um, I think the supervisor will have to endorse you, your application yes. to the university. Um, and so, yeah, as Darlene said, lots of documents, you'll need your CV, you'll need proof of, of your uh, research work, that you're capable of, of um, being part of this um, mm -hmm. research degree program. So all of that. Um, yeah, lots of, of patience and perseverance and organization skills for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the system goes like this. So you have to have a research idea first, which means you have to formulate your own research proposal. Mm -hmm. The usual thing that uh, students do when they produce their thesis. And then you make a pitch. That pitch, you have to find a professor in the target university you want, and then you email them your pitch. So you send them your research proposal. Of course, you email them nicely that I saw your name, that I saw your credentials, I saw your track record, in terms of the topics that you do and then you make your pitch if the per if the faculty or the academic staff likes your pitch you ask the faculty member or the academic staff concerned if they he or she can endorse your graduate application for especially for a scholarship and then if the person says yes then you look at the uh, website of the university for their scholarship application requirements such as uh, IELTS or, or TOEFL or uh, your transcript transcripts, uh, your curriculum vitae, your research proposal, and other sorts of requirements. Mm -hmm. And then you submit. And then if they, if the university accepts your pitch, then it's good for you to go there on a full scholarship. Yes, I think with any university, you have to have the patience to experience this tedious process of applying, especially if you want that scholarship, that degree. Now that you have experienced the fields of being in Australia, in the Macquarie University, what were the differences that you noticed between UST and the university you went to? especially in terms of education. Mr. Lee. Well, um, actually, that's a very difficult question for me. Um, I guess it's not about, like, it, I, I want to speak more about the culture and the experience of being in, in an international university. Um, in Australia, everything is casual. Like, people call each other by their first names. So um, it sort of um, makes you feel a sense of community, even with the higher ups, even the assistant deans or the deans, you call them, you call them by their first name. So um, it makes it, at least for me, it made it easier to, to navigate, you know, the different departments and to easily talk to people. I appreciate that very much, that casual environment. Yes. With Ms. Pia, in terms of education, can you share with us the differences between USD and Macquarie University? To my knowledge, the PhD programs that we have in the University of Santo Tomas are more traditional in the sense that there is a coursework component and then there's thesis. Um, whereas the degree that um, Darlene and I went for in Macquarie University um, does not have any coursework component anymore um, because it's really um, PhD by research. So from day one, you do research already. And but this comes with the assumption that you already have very solid grounding on the theoretical knowledge in your field. So for me, what that meant was I had to do a lot of reading and I had to source on my own, but also with the help of my supervisors, um, distinguished professor Ingrid Pillar and Dr. Loy B. Singh. Um, which workshops or seminars in Australia and that area I can attend that will be relevant for me. Um, I, I 
made a choice to be active in this reading group, Language on the Move, which my supervisor put together. So these are initiatives that I had to take on as a way to make up for the coursework that was missing in the program. And so it's a very highly autonomous learning experience in that sense. I mean, the, the PhD by research. Um, whereas I think I, I could say that in USD, our traditional program will involve like more guided learning in that sense, because you have that coursework. And also, um, I think that another major difference is that when it comes to the thesis defense, Macquarie University, and I think, I'm not too sure about this, but I think most, if not all universities in Australia do not have an oral defense. So our um, thesis undergoes a digital examination process, which just means you upload your thesis file onto this thesis submission portal online and it goes to your examiners. So the examiners will be experts in your field and they take at least one to three months, sometimes longer, to read your work and come back to you, your supervisors, with a report which basically says, look, we're going to award the degree or we're going to award it after you do the corrections or uh, I don't think you deserve this. So yeah, so that's the major difference, one major difference, I suppose, no oral defense. But that's not to say that it's easier because it's, it's a different challenge. You know, it's a different kind of challenge. We can obviously see the difference between uh, a developed country versus a developing country university. Mm -hmm. uh, the internet facilities alone and the IT infrastructure alone is a good example. Definitely Australia has a quicker bandwidth. Uh, Australia has a more sophisticated IT system. Yeah. So all the services for students, for faculty members, for officials. If uh, in the Philippines, probably we fill up forms sent through Microsoft Word and email back. There in Australian universities, thanks to their uh, developed status, they can easily tell people to just log on and then fill up forms online and then submit via portals or something. So that's that's one difference. But in terms of the you know method of teaching, yes. Probably it's the same. Um, our degree, we are degree by research, so we do research only. Yes, we had some refresher courses on research, but looking at the way the Aussies taught and some foreigners who are employees of, ad, of the university are, uh, are teaching, it's the same with the Filipinos. It's the same. Probably they may be more experienced in ways such as they had more research output mm -hmm. and they they enjoy the benefits of uh, technology like for example in a classroom there's a recorder so that when the student misses class the recording system will cover it and then it will automatically upload to their course site in, if in US it's Blackboard mm -hmm. in, in at Adelaide it's a canvas like the University of Adelaide are very much multicultural so you get to meet a lot of uh, you get to meet a lot of, uh, let's say, Chinese, Malaysian, South Asian, uh, Singaporean, uh, Latino, and some European students. Uh, that makes a very essential difference, especially because the Philippines is not primarily a country where many foreigners flock to for education. Mm -hmm. And moving on to our next question. It is a known fact that since you have to study abroad, especially in a pandemic, you are away from your family. Are there any particular challenges that you have experienced with this, Ms. Darlene? Challenges? Um, I think my story is different because um, when the pandemic started, mm -hmm. I was already done. So my challenge was actually when I came back and tried to re-enter the system. And I was so excited with all the new things that I have learned from abroad. And then suddenly, the world just closed down. So, you know, that was the major challenge. And it was it was really sad. Um, but then, you know, you have to deal with, with it. But Ms. Pia, were you away from your family during your course of studying? Yes, yes, I was. Um, but pre-pandemic, I could come home for Christmas. So that was a very um, important consolation for me, coming home to Butubumbung and, you know, your usual. And of course, family. Family is really yes. big for us. Um, in terms of challenges, being away from family, definitely, you know, like just worrying a lot about them, their situation, the reality, which you don't really know what that's like. Because, you know, I call, I call my family every day more frequently when the pandemic set in. And they always just say mom and dad would just be like, we're okay, we're okay, don't worry. But you know, sometimes they say things like that and it kind of makes you worry more because you don't know how true that is. 
<laughs> you know? And and you get bits and pieces of news from media and you don't know how to feel about all that. So that was definitely a challenge. Just the anxiety that comes with with that extra thing. And then of course trying to finish on time and quality work still, which was not easy because somehow the the rhythm changed. Um, and also I was I also battled with um, self-doubt, like, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic and, and all throughout this whole thing. Um, a very important talk revolves around the term essential, like essential work, essential things. And I started to question <laughs> whether finishing or doing my thesis, you know, my PhD program was essential. And, and at the end of the day, every day that I was asking myself that question, I kept saying, no, it's not essential in the grander, you know, the bigger scheme of things. I cannot see that it is essential, in fact. So that was kind of a real challenge for me. But um, yeah, with God's help, with prayers, because I was very transparent about my feelings. Um, my supervisors know about my struggle and they tried to encourage me as best they can. And uh, yeah, obviously we were able to um, manage that. Thank God. Yeah. Uh, I left there three years before the pandemic. So, like any foreign student, the adjustment comes at first, let's say, give it first two months. Once you have settled in, you can uh, make your way over there, especially if you've not been to a country like Australia. Although I have been in other countries, but for the long haul, not like this. And since I have been going to overseas countries for quite some time, and then my specialization is international migration. So the first thing I do is to look for a Filipino. And mm -hmm. the Filipinos will be your support group in some way. Just by speaking the Filipino language, it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big help. So the first thing that, that happened there was at my uh, faculty and school, I belong to the Faculty of Arts and the School of Social Sciences, the first thing I've, I asked is if, if there's a Filipino here. And then luckily there was. And then she connected me to other Filipinos from the university and then we hang out and then we meet weekly just to support each other out while studying because all of us are taking our doctoral degree by research. So we always talk about the thesis, when does it end, when will this uh, nightmare end, etc, etc, etc. Adelaide is not a big Filipino community, around 15, 16,000, but there are definitely Filipinos there. Just go to church, just go to the Catholic church every Sunday then in I will find that your compatriots over there. We want to congratulate you, especially that now that you have successfully achieved your PhDs. The next question, the last question is, how has obtaining your doctorate degree helped you in becoming a better fashion educator? Ms. Pia? Um, I think I'll have to say that the experience, um, the new knowledge and and all of this newness from this other place coming back here uh, I can I feel very energized to apply all of that as much as I can into the courses that I'm teaching um, like a, just a concrete example um, this term I was asked to convene a new course for English language um, studies majors and I was very excited like designing that course and inviting people that I met in Macquarie University to have a part in that in that course you know like to deliver some guest lectures here and there um, and I find that I'm also adopting some of the uh, methods that my own supervisors used when they were mentoring me. So that's those are some ways, I think. From, from what Pia just said, um, I think um, studying abroad made me more conscious about what's happening in the grander scheme of things. So it has made me more conscious as a thinker and it has made me energized as well and excited to share everything that I learned. And, um, you know, it's only now that I can design my courses, I haven't done that before. So that, you know, new experience of having the full autonomy and control of creating your new course, the best. <laughs> Number one, the experience in at the University of Adelaide kind of taught me to be more patient because now that I've felt what my students felt in thesis writing and for the long haul, uh, I think that is something that I have to exercise myself when I now teach my students. So that's one. Number two, you have to be very open-minded and understanding in the same boat that your supervisors in your thesis project understand you too. So I have to translate that understanding to them. And my good example there would be my Australian co-supervisor, my secondary supervisor, who is editing my thesis on one good eye because he, she has the, an eye problem for, for quite some time. 
and she mm-hmm. finished me off meaning she helped me finish my thesis just at the nick of time so if she had done it i think there's no reason for me not to do it to others if i'm thinking right now if i was a student i'd be excited to do the new methods that we have acquired from aquarium and now that you can apply it to usd that's such an, an exciting thing to experience to as you Thank you so much for that inspiring and fruitful discussion. Your passion for learning led you to reach new heights, which not only broadened your knowledge in your field and in the culture you've been exposed to, but also in your careers as educators, as catalysts of learning. Now that we got to talk to our guests, our show does not stop here, Tigers. Let us know more about how they dealt with their experiences in Culture Shock's brand new segment, Safe Pop. In this segment, our guests will share with us top five things or important tips about their culture shock experience. What are your top five tips or ways on how to survive with studying abroad? Mr. Lee. Take care of yourself, have a balanced life, eat, you know, um, drink, sleep, meditate, and pray. Probably much more faith in yourself because research is not for everyone. Uh, and research is a, an academic endeavor that many young people hate. So if many young people hate this thing, uh, I guess it's a matter of being motivated and curious. And if you combine both, then probably you can produce uh, that, that requirement that will lead you to the degree. Find your community because a PhD journey can be very isolating. So you need to find people who will always try to see the best in you, even if you are already doubting yourself. For me is celebrate complexity because uh, one thing that my supervisors have taught me is that um, human life, humanity is, is really beautifully complex and that's good, you know, and, and seeing that my own practice is different to the practice of another person, I should not think that all oh, mine is better or mine is worse, but just they're different. So they're beautiful and different, you know, so so just that and to celebrate that and be grateful for my uniqueness and everybody else's. Find your body language when you write your thesis. Whatever you want to do, like you want to slouch around, you want to listen to music, orchestra or rock or whatever. Find your groove when you write uh, because uh, that groove will dictate the pace of how you produce your opus. Thank you so much, Lumpia Patricia Tenedero, to Magdalene Demandante, and to Sir Jeremiah Openiano. We are grateful for spending your time and sharing your learnings with us today, and we hope to see you again as the Mashins the very soonest. Indeed, change is nerve-wracking, and facing them is definitely not for the most part. But for these three Tamashian educators who saw their chances abroad, change was something they fearlessly pursued for their passion, for the Tamashian community, and for the country. And that's about it! To see more of our future episodes, you can like our Facebook page, UST Tiger TV. You can also give us a follow on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok via at US Tiger TV. Thanks for tuning in today's episode of Culture Shock, everyone. I am Denise, your host for this show that embraces change and new experiences. Culture Shock.